Germany took a lot of Western Front territory in their spring offensives. But since July, the Allies have been pushing back bit by bit. And now, Germany is forced to do something German High Command deemed unthinkable. This week, Germany retreats. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, the Allies launched the Battle of the Islet and the Battle of Bapaum on the Western Front. Part of their new strategy of launching smaller attacks all along the Western Front that the Germans would be unable to predict. In Palestine, the Imperial Camel Corps played a ruse on the Ottomans in preparation for a coming attack that they would be unable to predict. In Baku, the small British force wondered how they would defend the city against an attack that was totally predictable. One such attack came this week. On the 26th, two Ottoman battalions, supported by artillery, attacked a British company on Mud Volcano near Baku. The British lost all their officers and 80 men. Two more British companies were thrown in as reinforcements and the defense held, but the Armenian battalion supposed to be there failed to turn up. It was looking very shaky for the British there. It was anything but that for them on the Western Front, though. On the 26th, they began the Battle of the Scarp, east of Arras. Two years ago, this Somme battlefield had halted the Allies, but not now. The Canadians fought their way right through it. For example, in 1916, Delville Wood had stopped the Allies for weeks. Now it fell in days. British commander Sir Douglas Haig was really using his armies very well at this point. The Battle of Albert ended the 29th, but you can see the Germans got no rest. The 1st, 3rd, and 4th armies were just going to keep hammering and hammering. On the 30th, Charles Mangin and the French attacked east of Soissons, pushing the Germans back across the River Ain. That same day, five miles to the north, the Americans captured Juvigny. So this week, the Germans withdraw 16 kilometers on a 100 kilometer front. German Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff rejected an appeal from his commanders to fall back further. This was because he feared a total collapse. Allied Supreme Commander Ferdinand Foch would say of Ludendorff on the 28th, the man could escape now if he would make up his mind to leave behind his baggage. At the end of the week, the Germans also began evacuating the Lalis sector in Flanders in the north, giving up all the ground they'd taken four months earlier. Actually, on the 25th, Foch wrote to Haig and congratulated him for widening British operations. Haig wrote back saying that what he wanted to do was push to Saint-Quentin and Cambrai while the Americans pushed north towards Mezières. The plan was to beat the Germans along a whole 130 kilometer front and threaten their single lateral railway from Valenciennes and Cambrai to Metz and Thionville. Haig won Foch over to this, but this plan would mess with American commander John Pershing's plans. Pershing, in command of the only weeks old American First Army, had been gearing up for its first independent offensive against San Miguel. But that would now be downgraded so that when it went off, and if it was a success, the Americans would have to stop advancing at the base of the San Miguel salient, since they would be pushing northeast, and that wouldn't fit with Haig's big plan, and then quickly change sectors so the next push in Haig's plan towards Mezières could go off west of the Meuse River. Pershing was actually on board with the change as long as his army was still autonomous. Here's some other bits of Foch's overall plans. With the Germans pulling back from the Lalis salient, they were exposing their railways up there that ran to the sea. So now, King Albert of Belgium, who'd been holding back his army since 1914, wanted to put it into the game. Foch suggested a Flanders attack to Haig and Belgian Army Chief of Staff Syriac Gilain. This would ideally take the heights east of Ypres, and from there they could hit the Rouleurs railway line. So, to sum up, Near the end of September, the British would attack eastward against the center of the Hindenburg Line, the French and Americans northward along the River Meuse, and the Belgians and British up in Flanders. Thing is, the Americans would have to open that offensive and would have the toughest job. First of all, whether or not the San Miguel attack was successful, Pershing was going to have to pull his men out of there and into the new sector to go up west of the Meuse. And that'll be fun logistics. But see, the Germans, had two main railway lines connecting their army with Germany itself. And the southern one could handle differing capacities at different spots. From Metz toward Verdun, it could handle like 
200 trains a day. But the parts of that line that crossed the Ardennes could only handle 80 or so, and in the section between Mezières, Cartignan, and Sedan, there was no other east-west route. Now, this section of the railway is only 50 kilometers from where the Americans would begin the attack. And from the rear German defense lines, if they could be reached, it was only 18 kilometers. So theoretically, the Americans would have a thinner belt of defense to fight their way through and were closer than any of the other allies anyhow. However, precisely for these reasons, the Germans knew they could not retreat and both the terrain and their defenses were forbidding. On the eastern flank of the attack lay the unfordable river Meuse with wooded heights above it. On the western flank lay further wooded heights, the dense and tangled Argonne forest. And in between, the high ground from Montfaucon back to Romagne. Now we visited there in 2017 and I can tell you from personal experience that Montfaucon is a serious commanding position. So the Americans would have to advance uphill on positions covered by German artillery, would have to pass four defensive lines, all with excellent machine gun lookouts, including line three, the Kriemhildestellung at the Romagna Heights, which was the local section of the Hindenburg line. So that would be the Americans job a few weeks from now when that offensive kicked off. They were hoping that they would have the element of surprise with them so they could at least overrun Kriemhildestellung before it could be reinforced. You might wonder how that could happen. It would be by the breaking off of the San Miguel attack and moving hundreds of thousands of men to where they were not expected to suddenly turn up. There was plenty of unexpected news at the moment though. The New York Times blared that General Dmitry Horvat, hailed by the London Daily Mail last month as the man to save Siberia, declared the 25th that he was assuming control of all Russian military forces in the Far East by coup d'etat. He had already set up a provisional government and proclaimed himself dictator. Thing is, there were a bunch of independent military forces out there, Russian and otherwise, more or less friendly to the Allies, but divided amongst themselves. Horvath's rule would last only an hour or two, however, when Allied diplomats made it clear that their forces would not support him. The Allies weren't just in Siberia, they had landed in force in Murmansk. German General Max von Hoffmann wrote of that, if the Entente set up a czar in Russia, then Russia will be closed to us. This week, the Russian Bolshevik leadership signs a supplemental peace treaty with the Germans in which the Russians promise to fight against the Allies in the North. And also under treaty from this week, Germany has full control of all Red Navy ships and facilities on the Black Sea. So that if Baku can be put in Bolshevik hands, Germany will get a third of that city's oil production. In return, Germany will prevent Finland from attacking Russia. Lenin and the Kaiser were making common cause, but you know, Lenin would have to survive for that to work, and he was shot and badly wounded the 30th, to the point where it was unclear if he would survive. More on that next week. And here's a note to end this week. An As Salam newspaper on the 28th and the French paper Le Temps, the 29th, both reported that the Sheik of the Senussi the Ottoman-backed North African tribesmen who harassed the Entente on the Libyan front before being defeated two years ago, arrived at Vienna before heading for Constantinople. He made the crossing from Tripoli to Pola in a German submarine, the first Arab leader to do so, as far as I'm aware. I found that quite interesting. Thanks, Rabi Rak, for that tidbit. So the week ends with more Allied advances in the West as the Germans pull back to consolidate a deteriorating situation for the British in Baku, a brief coup in Siberia, and an attempt on Lenin's life. And Doug Haig's plans for a big new offensive soon to come, bigger than the local attacks we've seen recently, bringing in the Belgians and kicking off with the Americans. Now, the Americans had surprised many by fighting pretty well so far the past couple of months now that they had joined the war in force. But this was gonna be some seriously tough fighting. I can't say what the tactical results will be, but I can say this, the Americans will finally join the war in another respect. They will have tens of thousands of dead soldiers. If you want to learn more about the German positions at the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, you can click right here for our special episode that we filmed there with our local battlefield guide and cool guy, Jean-Paul. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Zheng Chao Lu. Thank you for your ongoing support on Patreon. We could not do this show without you. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.